Isaiah chapter 55, 2 Timothy, the 55th, 55th book of the Bible. Ho, oh, everyone, everyone, everyone that thirsted, need drink. Come ye to the water. So, understandably, if you're thirsty, come to water. And he that has no money broke, come ye buy. How can you buy if you have no money? In the modern America, you do it with credit. You do it with a credit card. But you still got to pay. Still a bill that will come that you have to write a check. Here is something God is offering by by using Isaiah as inspiration, say, hey, you're thirsty, come to the waters and buy without no money. And eat. Yea, come. Buy wine. You have no money. And milk without money and without price. That's kind of an oddball piece of scripture there. But it shows that God will supply our needs and he won't charge us. When was the last time a place needed rain and God said, okay, before I give you rain, give me, give me cash, check, or money order. Yet man will charge man. And one of the things for the Jews is when they went to Babylon, when you read the Lamentations of Jeremiah, one of the things was, you know, now that Israel has been taken over by the Babylonians, we drink our water by price. You know, there's a there's electrical me I mean there's electrical meter. There's a water meter now. Back in the times where we're living in the Old Testament here, there was a city well. Jesus approached the well with a woman there. It wasn't piped to your house. You brought your bucket down to the well and you gathered the, the water that you needed. Usually children and women would go to that well. And receive. Listen, early America, the times of, the, of Tom Sawyer's written, there were, kids would go down to the to the main well and bring back the water. There was no charge. And somebody one day though, let's let's bring it into your house and let's charge you outrageous rates. But when we're talking about the water of God here, we're talking about John 4:14. John 7 37 Revelation 21 6 and 22 17 we're talking about Jesus says I am the water of life I will satisfy you come eat I am the bread of life Bible speaks of wine that cheereth man it's not as necessary as uh, intoxicating wine it's fresh new wine Water, eat, and wine. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which satisfies not? You find this in Haggai chapter 1 verse 5. Why are you spending your money for cell phone, entertainment, and a whole bunch of junk that you can't eat or wear. Why are you spending your money that there is no satisfaction for? The more alcohol you drink, the more alcohol you're going to want. The more money it's going to cost. The more you, you do part in drugs, legal or illegal, the more you're going to want. The more it doesn't satisfy. The Bible, I believe, says in the gospel spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ, let it be content with food and raiment. And if we were to be truly content and truly fitted to the Bible, we would have a lot more money than we do in our savings account if we just stuck to what the Bible says. We've got too much junk. We ought to be satisfied with what fills our soul with water, and what fills our soul with food. 
and that which is healthy, and that which is right. We all fall in the condemnation of wasting money. Hearken diligently unto me. This could be God speaking or Isaiah. And eat ye that which is good. See, healthy eating. And let your soul delight itself in fatness. That's a healthy soul. By healthy food. Incline your ear. And come unto me. Come to the Lord and hear. And your soul shall live. You don't live if you don't listen to God. You can get an early, early death. Those that end up in hell are not spoken about as eternal life. They're talking about eternal death. Listen, your soul lives forever in hell, but it ain't spoken of as life. It's spoken of as condemnation, as damnation. It's something you don't want to live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. All right, who are we spoken to? Every, excuse me, even the sure mercies of David. We're talking about the Jews. Isaiah is speaking to all the Jews. This is who he's writing to. And he's telling them, say, listen, come. You ain't got no money. You ain't got nothing. And I'll provide for you. And this may be a passage that goes into the, the end of the tribulation period as they run, as God has a place pre prepared for them, as he will feed them in the wilderness, in a city that they said that their sisters there already built to collect water. Large cisterns. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people. A leader and a commander to the people. Now we jump to a hymn. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee. Rome was not known, Germany was not known, America was not known. They didn't know anything about North, Central, and South America. Shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God. No. That hasn't happened yet. No one's truly run to Israel to seek God. Queen of Sheba came and sought Solomon for his for the, for the words that she heard about his kingdom, but it didn't say she searched God. The Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts chapter uh, 9, no, excuse me, 8, he comes to Jerusalem as apostolate to the Jews, coming home reading Isaiah. Now he may have come for the Lord thy God, and gone home with the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. And for the Holy One of Israel, for he had glorified thee. When? When have the nations come to Israel? When has God truly glorified Israel? Maybe in Solomon's time, yes. They were wicked in the times of Jesus, even before Jesus. Maybe the time in Ezra and Nehemiah, he will give you that, but this is probably yet future. This is where probably the Lord Jesus Christ will be sitting in Jerusalem upon the throne of David. Seek ye the Lord while he... Seek ye the Lord. Seek him. While he may be found, where is he going? Looks like maybe part of the book of Acts. There's coming a time when the Lord is going to remove himself for a period of seven years. 
There's a time right now that God has removed himself from the nation of Israel upon they have crucified his son. Now, individually Jews, God reaches out to, but as a nation, he's turned, their, he's turned his head on them. He's not looking at them as a nation. Call ye upon him while he is yet near. Now, Isaiah is writing before Babylon comes in. You better call upon God. You better start listening to Jeremiah. Because there's going to be a point that God is going to turn his head. He's going to let Nebuchadnezzar do whatever he wants to do. And it's total, absolute destruction with death in the street. Where Lamentation speaks about women eating their own babies. Let the wicked forsake his way. That's, that's true for today. That is true repentance, verse 7. You can't have someone say they're a born-again Christian and still living in their sin and enjoying their sin. You're not saved because you have not repented. Now, if you are continue in your sin, but man, you are sorry and you're trying to stop and you're seeking God in prayer and there's a desire, okay. But if you're marching around and you're saying, you know, God loves us too and, you know, and still living in your sins and pride of your sin, you're not saved. You are deceived. Because repentance for God, in order to be saved, is you forsake your wicked ways. That's repentance. That is the fruit of your work. Don't you dare tell me someone's saved. I don't care who he is, who she is. And they have not been sorry and have not tried to leave their sin. And they continue in it and, and, and lavish in it. Because I won't call you a liar. God will call you a liar. And you can have the blood of their lives on your fingertips. They're not going to be upon mine. And God will say to that person that believes they're saved and not, Depart from me. I never knew you. And then you be charged with the damnable sin of having someone think they're saved and not. The Bible definition for repentance is you forsake your wicked way. Read First John 1 John 1.9 and you tell me what problem you have. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you believe that there are people who are saved out there who are living in sin. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. God just does not charge you with physical activities. He charges you with your thoughts. Imagine how many Christians out there who are going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. That means you're saved. And you sat under a preacher, or maybe you didn't sit, maybe you didn't go to church. Either or. How many Christians are going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and realize their thoughts are going to be judged? How many ashes will there be now? Jesus said, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to think after, look at a woman to lust after in, in his heart, as already, he, he did not commit the crime. He just thought about it. And you'll stand before the Lord Jesus Christ as an adulterer. But Lord, I never touched. I don't care you didn't touch her. You thought about it. Murder. Lord, I didn't I didn't kill him. But you thought about it. Oh Lord, I gave up cigarettes. Yeah, but you thought about it. What you think about when the preacher's preaching will be charged to you. When a message God has given maybe to you or, or somebody in the church and you think, you know, what do I do after the service? What am I going to do this week and all that? What, what is your thought like? Let him return unto the Lord. 
So you better bring your way, and you better bring your thoughts to the Lord. And here's the first John 1 9. He will have mercy upon him. To our God, for he will abundantly pardon. With 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sins, if we repent of our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Pardon. You know what? I go, I'm going to prison tonight with the prison ministry. I don't know how many guys. I'm talking about the entire prison. If I were to walk there and line up all the prisoners on the grass and say to them, anybody who is in this place who is not guilty, raise your hand. All the men that raise their hand cannot receive a pardon. In order to receive a pardon as a definition and as a state of law document, you have to be guilty. So again, this verse here, you got somebody who professes to be a Christian and they don't sin. What's the pardon? You got to be guilty. No guiltiness, no need for a pardon. And this has happened through English history. The, the nation of England, there have been rulers of, uh, under the king and queen. They have gone into prison and sought someone who was guilty. I believe every time a president leaves office, he has a pardon for a certain amount of criminal in the jail system. I don't forget how many it is. How many of those people are released by the president who proclaim they're not guilty? And yet they'll say these six guys, whatever it is, have received a, a pardon by the President of the United States as he steps out of office. And you go to those six guys, whatever, are you guilty? If, if any of them says no, there was no pardon. Now if a man steps up and he's in jail, yes, I am guilty of this crime. Pardon can be issued. And you're clean. And the orders of the law, a governor, a state, a, a, a religion, a president, can release a man under the charges of penalty of guiltiness by a pardon. And that is what God is offering to the nation of Israel now. He's stepping out before Jeremiah, before Babylon, and says, Listen. Put away that wickedness. Come to me for water. Come to me for food. Come to me for life. Repent of your sins. Repent of your thoughts. Be ye guilty. And I'll free you. That is anything but what the United States government is teaching today, present time. You can't offer pardons in America today because everyone thinks what they're doing is right. For my thoughts, God speaking, are not your thoughts. You ever think about what God thinks about? Have you ever tried this? When we get to New Jerusalem... No thoughts would ever be a sin. We won't have the need to confess sins in New Jerusalem. Every idea we get in our head will be correct and right. And we don't need to check it with the Bible. We don't need to see, make sure. We don't have to pray about it. We don't have to search the Bible. It will be right all the time. Holy thoughts. Sometimes we get them, sometimes we don't today. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. God has a way. Jesus said, I am the way, 
man has a way called religion and education and science. That is not God's way. Depart from me, I never you, knew you. And they would say, well, Lord, didn't we walk in the streets? Didn't we do this in your name? And they would say, depart from me. I never knew you. Because you didn't do it my way. Now listen, if you go to the store and buy a cake mix, and you take it out of the box, and you throw whatever you want into that bowl with that cake mix, you don't follow the directions of that box. And then you do what everything needs to be done. Don't expect that cake to come out as a cake. At least what the box says it's going to be. Oh, then, you know what, what happened? It didn't do. It didn't, doesn't look like. It doesn't taste like it. It, it never turned out to be because you didn't do it the way the box said to do it. Now, if you do what the box does exactly and it don't come out right after that, then something's wrong with the box. But there's nothing wrong with God. You want your life correct. You want your life right. You better find out how God wants you to do it. And stick to it. So, uh, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. God has a high expectability that man can't make. You can't save yourself. You can't save a loved one. As far as salvation, how high is the way of God? You've got to have sinless blood. I ain't got it. I've, you've got to be holy to save someone else. That ain't me. You got to be the only begotten son of God. That sure ain't me. That's high of it. That's how high the expectation of God's salvation is. That's the salvation. And my thoughts, then your thoughts. It's man's is science, evolution, education, sex. And war. God's thoughts are upon his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the nation of Israel, taking care of those that are saved, being long suffering to those that are not saved, that set time when, when the Lord will come for his church, being righteous, and being holy. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not hither, <coughs> but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So God gives the rain. The rain makes plants grow. It provides seed for the guy to come and plant. And then he harvests it, and you take it, and you make bread, and you get the guy who eats it. There's nothing in here about taking things and making gasoline. There's nothing in here about taking a thing and putting it into a, a cannon and shooting it at a target. There's nothing in here about wasting food. Yet, as a country, we waste God's food. We don't use it before God intended it to be used for. Tobacco is a rodent pesticide. It kills rats and mice. It was never intended to put into a piece of paper and smoke. How about this? In prison, you give somebody a Bible. Certain Bibles out there with the pages that are that the Bible's made for, in prison, it is coveted 
not to read the Bible, but because the paper of that Bible makes a good cigarette. That's not what it was intended for. It was intended for you to know God and have a relationship with God and not to smoke. God intended a man that's married to take care of his wife. God intended a man that's a father to be with his family. Not on bowling night. Not away. If he's going to go on vacation, he goes on vacation with his wife. With his family. If he's going to be with a person in bed, it better be his spouse. We have taken things and used them for not what God intended them to be used for. So, okay, rain produces crops. It produces seed for you to sow and to, to provide food, which we read you don't charge for. God don't charge for it. Yet man will... I get a bill every month from the water company. There are areas in this country today that it is le illegal for you to have a well. You are extorted for city water to pay, for, to pay them for it if you don't want it. And I grew up with city water. So my grandparents' house. I love the city water. I mean, excuse me, the well water. I love the taste of the well water. It was nice. It was cool. But I remember when the city came, my grandfather said, hey, we're putting that line in your house, and I don't care what you say, you're going to get a bill. That's extortion. You are charging something that God gave us for free. That water came from the clouds. So shall my word do you recognize 55 10 11 somewhere in the gospels the parable of the sower and the seed and the seed was the word of god do you know when jesus told that parable they should have gone back to isaiah 55 there was a sower that went out and spread seeds some way to the wayside, and there was four or five places. And then when he took the disciples off the side, he said, "Listen, the the sower is the sower. The the word is the seed, and the grounds are the men's hearts." And then Jesus turns around with chapter ten, verse eleven, quotes to Satan: "Man shall not live by." Bread alone, but by every word that proceeds. Do you see what 10 and 11 has done? Jesus' words to Satan, Jesus' words to the people, and Jesus' words to the disciples. <coughs> Excuse me for my cough. Speaks of Isaiah 55. So shall my word. Be that goeth forth out of my mouth, God's holy mouth, it shall not return unto me void. What's that mean? God has a purpose for his word. If somebody comes up to you and explains to you the gospel, God intended that person to come to you for you to be saved. If you don't get saved, it's not void. It's to your discredit. It is to prove you judged guilty and condemnation. Somebody brings you the, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you receive Christ as your Savior, then it comes back as fruitful. And you're supposed to produce more fruit. You're supposed to produce more Christians, and then they're supposed to perform. Uh, they're supposed to produce more Christians. That 
won't return to me void as you're to produce fruit. If you don't, you are considered a dead tree and it be to your condemnation. But the purpose of God is for people to be saved. You know why God has given you the King James 1611 Bible 66 books? He has given to you that you may read it and study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly divine. He expects you to learn daily. So your life won't be void, but fruitful and rejoicing and fellowship and joy and peace and love and patience. But if you don't read the word, it does not return God void. The opportunity is there to your disadvantage. It will come up as... Um, your disadvantage that you had the opportunity and you didn't do it. There's a thing in law called the uh, burden, not, not the burden proof, but where you can't say I never knew. Um, this came to me, left me, and we're getting this. You can't say in the eyes of law, I didn't know that was a law. You could have known. You can't say, oh, you know, I was in this perverted church and I didn't know I was supposed to witness. If you got a Bible, if you can buy a Bible, in America you can. If you can obtain a Bible, you can go to a library in America and the Bible's there. And if you can't open a Mark 16 and see that the Bible says go in all the world and preach to God, if you don't, you're at wrong. And it won't return void to God. It will turn the fact is that you did not. You are without excuse. But not return void back to God. If you open up Mark 16, oh, I'm supposed to go preach the world to God to the world and support missionaries by that verse too and do it. And then you know what? It comes back that God is fruitful. If I read over there, I forget which one of the books that Paul writes, he writes, uh, a man that's a thief, let him steal no more. Let him go get a job. I'm not quoting that verse completely. And you read that. And you are a thief. And you stop thieving. And you get a job. That is to God's glory and, and honor. That did not return void. That turned to God fruitful. But you know. I'm going to steal, I'm going to take, and stuff like that. That goes to your discredit. That goes to your guiltiness. You have done wrong. Listen, when mom tells you, dear, don't touch the hot stove, and you never touch that, you obeyed your mom, okay, she, she knows something I don't, you don't touch it. Man, that's the mom mom's credit. You know, I don't I don't have a son to have get burned or I don't have a daughter to have a mark for life. But when you don't listen to your mother, you don't listen to your father, you get ow That didn't return to your parents, boy. They warned you. It was turned to your discredit that now you got a big owie. You got a boo boo. That boo boo is not void. <laughs> it was a lesson. God's word, God talking, sends out, he wants everybody to do right. That's to his credit. And if you don't, that's to your judgment. You can use the word of God for yea, or you can use it for nay. God would rather have you do yea. But it shall accomplish that which I plead. All 48 prophecies about the Lord Jesus Christ were all accomplished 100%. You know there are prophecies in there about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? It's going to be accomplished. 
You know, there's pa there's passages in here about the church age. There will they will be accomplished. Paul speaks about the church age going into apostate. It's going to be just scum of the earth. And it's going to happen. The Bible speaks about a seven-year period called Jacob's trouble. Three and a half years of the great tribulation. The last, it's going to happen. The Bible speaks to us about New Jerusalem. It's going to happen. It shall accomplish that which I please. When you do what the word of God tells you to do, properly study to show thyself approved unto God, a man that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In other words, I ain't going to go knock on people's doors and tell them to build an ark. That's wrong. I'm not going to go tell anybody, you know, don't eat this fruit. That's wrong. When I go tell someone to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, that pleases the Lord. When the Lord tells me thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not bear false witness, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You're to make a proper living. You're to have your wife, have your wife ask you questions. You're to raise your children without an admonishment. You're to love the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart and your soul. When I do that, that pleases God. And when you please God, that is the most important thing you can ever do. When Satan went up to God in Job 1 and 2, God was pleased with the outcome. Too many times when Satan goes up to God about you and me, Satan walks away pleased. And that's wrong. When you make Satan happy, you're wrong. Because the Bible speaks we are to please God. And it shall prosper in the thing where I, where to I sent it. So what's the Bible say as far as salvation? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Talking about salvation. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then salvation. If you disregard what God said about the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation, then God said you will be damned to hell. You'll be put in the lake of fire for all eternity. There's the two purposes. God will either condemn you to the lake of fire for all eternity, or he'll bring you into his presence in New Jerusalem. He'd rather have you go to New Jerusalem, but if you want to do the other, there's two options with God. Again, the yea or the nay. You can't have both. God sent the word for people to be saved. And God sent the word that if you don't want to believe, you, you'll go to hell. For ye shall go out with joy if you do what God wants you to do. And be led forth with peace. Where have you seen joy and peace? That is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now if you ain't got the Holy Spirit, you don't have no joy and peace. Jesus said the peace of the earth is only temporal. But his peace is eternal. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing. Now is that literal? Well, that's not the millennium. There are no mountains and hills in, in the millennium. That is only Jerusalem is the mountain place. It says, every valley shall be exalted and every mountain shall be made low. God has given Israel a second chance right now to get right and, and avoid Babylon. If you get right right now, I won't send Nebuchadnezzar. And the land will be so happy. You know what one of the things that Israel needed to do if they were going to get right with God? God said every seven years you're to give the land rest. You know why they went to Babylon for 70 years? Because that is how much time they did not give the land rest. And I think Jeremiah gives a number about that. Not Ezekiel Jeremiah gives why. That that seven year Sabbath rest of the land was not 
followed. And when they're in 70 years in Babylon, that is how much time that the land will rest. Because they didn't make it rest. So when they obeyed God and the law about the land, the Sabbath, the rest, the land will rejoice. America's land is not rejoicing. We work it, work it, work it. 24-7, 7, seven days a week, we work, we work, we work. No rest. We're going to burn out. We've got to put fertilizers and crap in our dirt. That is unhealthy. You ever see what some of those pesticides do when they're in a container? If they were to get loose, if they were getting a water system, they ever get in the environment, they ever get in the air? And that stuff is supposed to help you grow your, your crops? The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. That's a millennial passage. Instead of the thorn, the curse, shall come up the fir tree. Instead of the briar, that's a curse, no weeds. Now this is the millennium. The curse is removed off the earth. No weed. Instead of the briar, there shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name. For an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. So the day when we get no weeds is a sign. When we get fruitability of the land, it's a sign of God to the Jews. Because 1 Corinthians, I think it's one eleven, the Jews require a sign. So the fact is, one day you're going to get that perfect garden that you want today. You're going to be able to plant a garden in the millennium one day. And it says that someone's going to plant the seed and right behind you they're going to be picking the crop. That's with the curse removed. We're going to go back to Eden. We're going to go back to the garden of Eden. Before Genesis 3. And perfect fellowship with God who is Jesus Christ. And he's there. It's not going to be God came in the cool of the afternoon. and it, No. He's always going to be there. Seated in Jerusalem. Upon David's throne. But God is giving right now in Isaiah's time. 712 B.C. right around that time. He's giving the nation of Israel repent, uh, a chance to repent and get right. They will when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. The second time. 